uh, with the with the same word, and her fa current favorite word is brindle. <laughs> So Frankie's relationship to this word is really interesting because I actually, before I moved to Tucson, I worked in a locked psychiatric facility for adults with chronic mental illnesses. They don't even quite have those in Arizona as far as I know now. So um, I guess that's all I need to say if I want an introduction. Rosemary, in LA I became you. Some memory of the way you rode the bus away from home, from your father, really, who scared you so badly you hid under the table. The first time they thought something was wrong, it wasn't because you were scared. They both knew he could be scary, even though they never admitted it to you. But because you were meowing, quietly at first, and then with more conviction, crouched under the table. You were 12. Did he tell you then to become an actress because you were being so dramatic? I don't know if he ever hit you. But I know you tried to snap a woman's neck once and almost succeeded. You walked like you were still 300 pounds, but you lost weight and all of your teeth. Or maybe it's more true to say that when you'd lost most of them, the rest were pulled. It was the only service covered by your dental plan by then. No wonder you were angry. The side effects of how you had to live would be enough to make me angry. But to think directly of the main axes of truth in your life, or if not true, some version of mundane reality. Locked up in a building that smelled of far gone yesterdays and surrounded by paint shades too dark, too dark to catch the little northwestern light that landed in your room. The one chair out on the smoke porch that was the only one you understood. You got in fights about it because nobody could relate to you having a chair that was the only one you understood. Your mother sent you things <coughs> Your mother sent you things you might need at logical intervals, but there were no cards, no little gifts, no Christmas presents, even though you still counted down the days gleefully every year. What you called giving birth, the rest of the world called having an accident in the middle of the night. Your baby then, a yellow stain that no one wanted to manage. In the mornings, after so many of my arrivals, plastic gloves, biohazard bags, and a trip to the laundry room, but not after you told me her name, it was usually the same each time, little glow. Years later, I learned of the Spanish phrase, to give a light for birth, and I think of the landscapes you won't ever see. By the time you were 18, you'd hop the bus to Hollywood, but your chart said nothing else. You spoke of acting, and I can imagine a time when catching a break in Hollywood seemed plausible, or at least possible. I would have believed you were a model. In your face, a deep beauty, and in your movements, an unswerving confidence. But you told me you were on that cruise the year before I met you, when you had already lost your teeth, already lost so much more than your teeth. You looked so happy, recounting the places you visited. And I wondered then about whether it wasn't something of a blessing to remember a history that is not your own, a kind of imagination in reverse function. If your days are spent smoking cigarettes until your fingers yellow and finding your only real comfort is a stuffed horse who sits on your narrow bed in your narrow, urine-soaked room, how obliging of your mind to take you on a cruise, show you the beauty of the world, reflect your beauty to you in the eyes of offstage admirers. How obliging of your mind to give you a baby every morning instead of a mess to clean up and the knowledge that your body is past being able to carry one. I was not in Hollywood, but in LA I saw trees like prehistoric towers lining the streets and watched a 3D film about Pina Bausch. In the theater I became you for a moment, seeing the world in front of me in blurry multiple, edge over edge, until I put on glasses that made the multiplicity three-dimensional and single. I want to say singular, and it was that too. I felt suddenly your frustration at trying to explain that the world is round and alive and moving quickly toward you when everyone else could only see blurry flatness taken for the extent of what was there to be seen. It's a wonder you never gave up trying to explain what was there for you in stereo, in stereoscopic 3D, as we unfocused our vision, trying to make the world as we knew it more clear, or at least contiguous. And who would have believed you anyway if you'd somehow managed to fashion paper spectacles with blue and red lenses and shouted triumphantly that finally we might see your reality? 
you probably would have been written up, the glasses discarded as a quaint craft project or some other artifact of delusion. When people say schizophrenic, so often what is heard is split, broken, or out of touch with reality. Your diagnosis was based on the concept of emotions split from thought. But who can say what emotions are called for anyway, or who is more colonized by perplexing delusions than anyone else? And who is to say what of reality there is to touch, and what edges, what whole planes, in fact, we might be missing in our smug perceptions? Can empiricism explain the way you spoke of my father, but never my mother, except to say at times that you were my mother? Can scientific inquiry measure the chances that of all the names you could have taken, that of all the names you could have taken on once you were sent away to the state hospital, you chose my mother's and called for me like I was your daughter? Thank you. Thank you.